Welcome to Residential Tech Talks. I'm Jeremy Glowacki, Executive Editor of Residential Tech Today. On this week's podcast, Kim Parker joins us from Austin, Texas, where he was recently hired to serve as Chief Operating Officer for Screen Innovations. Screen Innovations launched in 2003 by Ryan Gustafson as a garage startup in Austin to provide projection screens for home theater and commercial video projector installations. As the industry evolved over the years, SI expanded its product mix to also include window coverings. Our guest today joined the company three months ago after 13 years with Control 4 and Snap 1, most recently as Snap 1's Vice President of Sales for Specialty Channels. He brings to SI not only his veteran experience with those two major industry brands, but also a diverse history with several other familiar names in the industry, including Savant, Sonance, Netstreams, and GE Smart. Kim Parker, welcome to the podcast. Congratulations on the relatively new job. Yes, it still feels new, but in some ways it feels like it's already been a long time. So thanks for having me. Well, great to see you. And as I mentioned in the intro, you have amassed an interesting collection of roles for very notable industry brands over the past 25 years. Um, I do want to take our audience through a bit of your career arc um, in a while, but I wanted to start with current day. Um, clearly, I see your role as COO with, with SI as a promotion for you after serving mostly um, as a VP in recent years. But besides taking that next career um, ladder step, so to speak, uh, what was it about the opportunity with Ryan at SI that appealed to you? Well, Ryan and I joked that this is the longest job interview we've both ever had because um, we've been friends for the last 10 years. I, since I uh, moved to Austin, was introduced to Ryan through a, another mutual friend, and we quickly became buddies because we have a lot of similar interests outside of work. And um, we've always talked about business. We've always talked about the industry, having tons of friends in the industry and how you know, we can um, help one another and, and, and just serve the industry in general to, to make it a better place to, to live and work and, and have fun. So um, it, the timing just seemed right. Uh, with, with everything that I had done at Control 4 and Snap 1, which are great companies and uh, and I learned so much working there. It uh, was just time to, to take a, a step and, and take this opportunity. It was local in my backyard as well, right? So that made a lot of sense as well. And and I wanted a new challenge, and this is certainly providing that new challenge. So that's the main reason why I joined the company. Yeah, so you uh, are working locally now for a company based in Austin, whereas with Control Force, Snap, that whole big brand, um, you were probably more on the road, virtual, what were um, yes. your local connections? Yeah, so my wife's really happy that I'm home more now, and the family is too, and uh, I was traveling a fair bit, being in sales, and I loved it. Uh, you know, I always say that I'm an advocate for the dealer before I am an advocate for a company because the dealers are really what, you know, really what drive our industry, and uh, I've just made so many good friends over the years that I didn't really feel like I was traveling for work in a lot of ways. I felt like I was just traveling to go hang out with my good friends and, and help them, you know, improve their businesses. So really here to serve the, the dealer community. Yeah. And I, and I was looking over the, um, the announcement from when you were hired three months ago and uh, kind of going over some of the, the comments that you made in your quotes and Ryan made in his quotes. And uh, you, you mentioned that you were blown away by um, SI's Black Diamond screen material when you first saw it uh, touring the facility. Uh, several years ago, and you even encourage dealers who are not, you know, that's not your business doing screens, but you yeah. told dealers about that product. So you've been kind of advocating for the brand even before, long before you were working for the brand, yes. it sounds like. Yes, I was their number one unpaid salesperson. But <laughs> <laughs> it came with fringe benefits as well. Um, yeah, I love the, I love the black diamond screen. I, I uh, uh, once I got the demonstration, I knew immediately I needed to put one in my own home. And I've now owned four SI screens since then in multiple um, homes and, and uh, applications. And I've loved every single one of them. They've, they've just performed extraordinarily well. The family loves it, obviously. And, and uh, um, every time I, I go to a bar or a restaurant and I see that white screen all washed out with all the lights, I think, man, these guys need this ambient light rejection technology that have such a better experience for their customers. And 
even had a, a sample unit that I would take and show them, hey, you, this, there's better material out there. You guys should upgrade and, and, and would just show them the A-B test of, yeah, you see, this is a lot better. And a lot of them would be like, wow, where do I get that? So, so I'll just, just pulling it out of my car while on the road. And so it's just been a, um, a fantastic experience supporting SI over the years as well. Even though the company has been in shades for a while, or window coverings is the broad term for it, because I know there's more than just uh, shades, but there's all kinds of products related to outdoor um, uh, shading kind of opportunities as well, and uh, and various motorized products. But uh, you mentioned that you saw an opportunity there, and that you could help them scale that um, to 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 meet the the demand. So um, I was just wondering, you know, kind of what you see as untapped opportunities out there, how you, uh, with your network of, um, you know, contacts, your experience, what you see as your ability to help them grow that part of the business as well now. Yeah. Shades, obviously, uh, a growth opportunity for the company, um, screen being the core and main part of our business. Um, but shade presents a unique opportunity. It uses a lot of the same parts and pieces as our motorized, uh, screens do. And so it seemed like it was even though it might be attacking a different part of the home, um, a lot of people will put one screen in, but they'll put 30 shades in. And so that that opportunity to scale um, is relative to the amount of money that you can make as a dealer on a project, right? So if you're doing just the home theater, um, that might provide you a certain level of income on a project. But if you're doing the theater and you're doing lighting control and you're doing all the shade coverings, um, that presents even a larger opportunity uh, for you as the dealer. So we felt like that was pretty a natural progression for us just because manufacturing wise, very, very similar in terms of process. Now, different materials, different fabrics, obviously, but, you know, cutting fabric and all that stuff, we were already an expert at. So it just, it just played right into our strengths. Yeah. And, and it's also one of those growth categories where you just see people, I mean, I hear dealers still say, yeah, we're getting into more screen or, uh, shades. And I'm like, wow, that category is pretty mature at this point, but they're just folks that for whatever reason, whether it was price point, um, not being retrofitable in the old days, because everything had to be hardwired. Now there's all kinds of battery opportunities for motorized um, window yeah. shades. Just I think the market has opened up uh, the potential uh, cost as well. Just the price point was just so high in the early days for those. And you just in certain markets couldn't make the case for a client yeah. to <laughs> spend that money on something that they could get maybe at a more uh, bo big box manual level. Um, but it, it seems like um, whereas projection screens, you're kind of seeing a change in the market where there's a lot of options there where it's hard to sell two piece all the time because you've got big panels that you can put in a home or even you know, the fixed pixel kind of um, video walls as well. So, but whereas windows, um, window coverings, that's just a huge mm -hmm. market potential there, it sounds yeah. like. So, so you see that, I mean, there's still a core, you said it's the primary business is, 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 is projection screens for the company. Yes. So that's still a very strong category. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's uh, one that we're uh, definitely focused on. It's, it's, you know, what's the, it's the DNA of the company. Um, you can see behind me, Austin Film Screen was the original name of the company, um, and that DNA still is alive and well inside of the company for for screen and the and that big picture experience. And um, while you can spend a million dollars, as you saw on, uh, recently, there, there was an installation that was a million dollars for a video tiling kind of application. You just or video wall type application, you just go like, wow, that's just not reachable for the for the mainstream consumer. So two pieces still really the most affordable way and visually one of the best ways to get immersed into a large screen experience. So it's still a focus of ours for sure. Yeah. And I, I've been, I've been touting the opportunity. I mean, I, as soon as I heard after um, the COVID, you know, kind of economy started and people started reinvesting in their homes a lot more, I heard, Oh, we're doing dedicated theater again, which yeah. was great news. And mm -hmm. it, it varies from dealer to dealer who, who says that, but it's still, um, it's interesting that folks are saying we want a space that's just, we're not necessarily going to the movies that anymore out into the theater. Yeah. So we want to make our own movie theater. So that's great to hear. Yep. Um, and I just wanted to ask you, so the role of COO um, now 
it sounds like it, it it involves so much of your experience in the past and bringing it all together. You're not just in sales, you're doing um, product development, um, training and education, all that stuff kind of rolls into that, that role of guiding um, that part of the company. Is yeah. that, is that kind of how, how you would describe what a CEO does for SI? On the, in, on the outside, we call it COO, but I think on the inside, it's, it's a different, uh, a different title that we use. Uh, you know, Ryan's the visionary of the company and I'm the implementer of that vision and just making sure that, you know, we're able to implement that vision from a strategic business opportunity, whether that's, um, you know, we have the, the market that we want to go after, uh, whether it's uh, funded, you know, whether we have the talent inside or outside, just making sure that we have everything that we need in order to, uh, to go accomplish that, that vision of Ryan, that Ryan has and make sure that it's, uh, you know, a good business decision. Yeah. So do you, um, do you see, it's only three months in, so I don't want to put, any, put you on the spot too much as far as, uh, assessing, uh, the company, uh, thus far with your role, but, um, are, are there opportunities in the channel, um, to expand just within like the custom integration CDA channel, or is it also looking at other outlets? Are you, are you seeing, um, more like commercial, uh, development, commercial integration, um, other trades out there that that kind of could help uh, with the brands. Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, there are a lot of synergies between what we do in both shade and screen in the residential vertical, in the commercial vertical, um, and then in the different channels with inside those verticals as well. So you know, typically we've been inside of the Cedia channel, and we have uh, opportunities uh, going out to the you know, the, the core window covering companies that are essentially like a CDA dealer, but just in the window covering business, you know, the, there's a large opportunity for us there to, to play with them because um, they're, they're getting requests more and more for their products to integrate with control systems, whether that be something as simple as Alexa to something as complex as a control for a restaurant or a savant. Um, you know, these are, these are the questions that they're getting now and they don't have that expertise. So, we're finding that there's a lot of partnerships that are ha happening between window covering companies and the Cedia channel. And then there's the bridge, there's that bridge that needs to happen. But we're also seeing that the Cedia dealer um, or the custom install dealer is really taking to shades as an opportunity to expand um, what they do in a home. So they might have, they might've have had to find a hundred projects in a year before, whereas if they add window coverings, that might reduce that to 75 projects. And I can tighten my relationships with the builders or designers or architects that I'm working with. And I can do more inside of a home and then figure out if I want to scale my company up or not. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I have learned just recently, as much as I feel like I understood about the, the motorized shade um, business and opportunity there that there is that that niche of just window um, dealers out there, especially especially in some of those bigger markets, like where you've got high rises and that sort of thing, where they don't do any other integration. It's just all window stuff. So, um, but but like you said, when you want to have that integration, then bringing those two people together uh, and helping each other out that's a great opportunity. Um, I, I did want to um, kind of transition into talking a little bit more about your background because uh like i said you're you're hitting on so many brand names in our industry that uh, i'm curious about your experience and how it all evolved and like so many uh in this industry uh that are that end up on the manufacturing side you started an integration right you were an integrator in the early days yeah i actually started out as a secretary for an integration company. oh really okay and, um i was uh uh, I was doing car audio previous and, and, um, I wanted to break into the residential space. And the only way I could do it was to be hired as a secretary to answer phones and make some callbacks uh, to customers and, uh, quickly moved into a, uh, an installation technical role and then into a, into a, a sales slash project management role at that company. And then, and then had an opportunity to start my own company, which seems like a common story for a lot of dealers is that they started a, as an integration company. And as we know in this industry, in some states, it's a pretty low bar to start your own company as it was where I was living at the time. And, 
And, uh, you know, hey, we made mistakes, we grew, um, did quite well as a little integration company. And, and even all the employees that I had hired during that tenure, most of them are in the business still, mm. um, where they didn't start out in the business. And some of the biggest dealers that exist now in the, in the country were dealers that actually worked for me as, a, as, a, as an installer. So it's really, really kind of fun to see how that's transitioned over those years on the installer side. So. Now you started in Utah. Were you in Salt Lake then at that point with the integration yes. company? Okay. Yes. And that, so. that was Audio Visions Plus, the one that you started? Um, that was my company, yes, yeah. Audio Vision Plus. So. Okay. Yeah. What did you like about that experience back in those days? And and, uh, and what, what were those those headaches that you were just happy to leave <laughs> behind when you went to work for a manufacturer? Yeah. Um, well, we were the, the biggest struggle we had was just educating people on why they would want integrated technology into their home. You know, whereas you know we were dealing with the big Mitsubishi, you know, I don't know how heavy they were, but they were these thirty-six inch and forty-inch TVs that weighed a thousand pounds, and you'd you know build a custom niche for them, and that that was the that was the big screen experience. And then you put in big screen TVs, TV, TVs that you flushed into a wall, and so some of it was construction based, um, and the. The really technical stuff, you know, you were actually sitting there coding Crestron and and uh, the, it, so it was, a, was a lot different then. It was a lot harder to be successful as a dealer because you were really relegated to the really, really ultra rich and high end homes. And that, you know, kept us small and kept us boutique. But when I was uh, uh, presented the brand, which was just called Smart at the time, and then became GE Smart, powered by Microsoft, as GE and Microsoft did their first joint venture ever together and invested in this company. We were really looking at an opportunity to drop that cost down to where it was something more affordable for the broader population. And um, you know, the 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 original concept was really good. It was, it, but I think the implementation of powerline carrier technology in homes is just a difficult way to go to market, which is where that company was sitting, but learned so much from that experience as well, had a very visionary leader. Um, and I was running their tech support and professional services and training at that company. And, uh, it was just great to, you know, that was kind of my first entree into meeting a whole lot, uh, a lot more dealers in our, in our space and, and, uh, you know, developing relationships and friendships from there. But, but that was my first entree. And, and what you leave behind when you're um, when you're an owner of an integration company is, you know, you you wonder at times, does my business own me or do I own the business? And I was very technical, um, but I was I would say I was like many other in our industry where I was not business savvy. Mm -hmm. And I had a business partner who was fairly business savvy. He had already um, built a, a fairly sizable construction company, and and. Um, um, he he was working with me to teach me business in general and and uh, we hired a great general manager um named nate mansfield who's still in the industry today working for ati out of uh, out of salt lake um but we just had uh, a tough time um, really figuring out how do we scale our business and and grow it to a point where we could really be successful. And we kind of ran into this ceiling where everybody runs into where you hit $2 million and it's like, okay, how do you get to three? Mm -hmm. How do you get to four? How do you get to five? And, and it seems like if you don't have the systems and processes or the expertise to run the business, um, that's a tough, that's a tough hill to climb um, as just someone who's technical. So we were, we were looking at companies like, uh, you know, audio design in Utah. I don't know if you remember that company or, or even were around when that company was around, but that turned into auditions, which turned into another company and, and I'm forgetting their name, but, uh, um, those were the companies we were watching like, wow, how are they scaling? How are they doing it? And, um, that's how I became actually friends with Mike Braithwaite, the CTO of, of SI oddly enough, as we met when I was an integrator and he was an integrator in Utah. Okay. Very but, nice. Uh, but you leave, you leave, a, when you go from a, a being a dealer to a manufacturer, you, you leave behind a, those midnight calls and those Super Bowl Sunday calls uh, of my TV's not working or whatever the case might be. But um, it, there's other challenges, obviously, of working on the manufacturing side, especially in support, because they're calling you now on a Sunday saying, how do I fix this issue? And right. You're helping them through it, doing everything you can to make sure their customer's happy. Well, you know, it's, you ask what I remember, what that was, right around the time that I entered the industry as well. And uh, I sort of started reporting on the commercial side 
first in 96. So you were running your company from 95 to 99, it looks like, if that's correct. And um, and then right around 99 was when our company did our first Cedia daily uh, newspaper magazine at Cedia at, in New Orleans. So it was kind of a interesting little moment in time there when the industry yeah. kind of kicked into gear, um, right, as you were switching over to manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, the only Cedia I've missed, by the way, is that New Orleans flood Cedia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was something right there. That, you, you missed out on an interesting experience. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, so GE Smart then uh, that that just gave you that first taste of um, of something that could be the future of the industry if it got figured out right. But that power line thing that that was always I've I've had a little bit of experience with some power line products that that you know sometimes they work great and sometimes they just got get glitchy because power gets in the way, I guess, you know, there's something else going through that, that line. But it, at the time it seems like, well, what, what's our existing inf infrastructure in the home that, that kind of would make yeah. sense to an engineer, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good strategy. Um, unfortunately, technology limited the ability to be successful at it. So, well, we will continue our conversation with screen innovation, COO Kim Parker after the break. Do you want superior smart home automation at a great value? Shelly Wi-Fi relays by Alterco Robotics cover DC to line voltage, allowing you to control lights, outlets, appliances, garage doors, pumps, and much more. There are Shelly sensors and power measurement devices to help you measure temperature, humidity, lux, or motion, and electrical consumption from single wire to three phase with neutral. You can use Shelly with a licensed driver for Control 4, Elon, or other premium systems, as well as your customer's existing hub, voice assistant, or any platform that accepts REST, MQTT, or CoAP. Shelly can make IoT very easy. Available now at Blackwire, City Electric Supply, and Worthington, or at ShellyUSA.com. Welcome back. We're talking with Screen Innovation's new CEO, COO, Kim Parker. Um, <laughs> con continuing along your career path, you um, in 20, 2002, you, um, you joined another company uh, that is well known in the industry, NetStreams. What drew you to that brand next? Yeah, so that was um, when, when GE Smart was uh, disbanded, you could say, and GE took their part of the intellectual property and Microsoft took their part of the intellectual property. We were left with what we were developing that wasn't released yet, which was um, IP audio products that we were developing at GE Smart, which then turned into NetStreams. Okay. Uh, which I also had a chance to work with Michael Braithwaite there as well, oddly yes. enough. But uh, he was the the chief inventor of, of that uh that product and uh, it was well ahead of its time, and it was a great experience uh, to 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 go from being at a fairly decent sized company to being five people starting a new company and figuring out how do we how do we get an office and how do we uh, start developing this technology and who do we partner with and how do we start attracting dealers and how can we sell a product today to help fund the future developments of of the things we're trying to develop that are probably a year or two years away from now. So um, that was uh, that was a lot of fun. It was uh, it was also a lot of hard work. That was probably the first time in my life where I'd worked, you know, forty eight hours straight with little to no sleep, uh, getting ready for a trade show and figuring out, you know, how do we show our technology when it's not working? It's in alpha, and man, we gotta we gotta just get this thing done. And so, um, but those were fond memories of that, of that time together. Cause we were really tight. We were like a family and, and we just knew that we had to do whatever it took to, to try to be successful. So, yeah, you guys get, you do a good job of faking it for these, uh, pr these <laughs> sad press people walking through a CDA and, uh, the only time it ever catches us is when it's like, you're pulling up a presentation and something locks up and like, Oh yeah, this, this has not happened yet. Um, and, and you know, it did before, but <laughs> we had a lot of smoke and mirrors back in those, <laughs> yeah, in those early days. Yeah. Well, um, I, the other thing I find interesting is that you're, you're in that Salt Lake, um, area of Utah and just so much, um, of our industry tech innovation was occurring there. What, what would you, I've always tried to figure it out. Like there's, um, somewhere it starts and then another company bounces off of another one and they just start becoming kind of yeah uh, a, a big blend of of like-minded individuals doing slightly different things what would you credit salt lake city's role in this to be with all these companies that came out of there 
You know, it, it, it's funny because I look at uh, psych, uh, Salt Lake City specifically um, and the culture there and that entrepreneurship mentality um, that exists there. Um, I, I think that that's really what, what drove it uh, to have so many different manufacturers that are in our industry that are based out of Salt Lake um, was quite interesting to me as well. But um, and then there's a lot of really successful dealers out in that market as well that not only serve the Utah market, but expand and, you know, serve the the neighboring states. And in even my company, we went all the way from Florida to Hawaii, um, you know, to, to service our clients as we met clients that were that were very wealthy building second, third, fourth homes in the Park City Deer Valley area that that took us to their main homes in California, which took us to their vacation homes in other parts of the world. So um, there's a, there's a lot of people that, uh, influence that, that kind of culture inside of Utah. So, um, just a really entrepreneurial mindset, I think overall. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so. And, uh, we, then, then at, at some point you end up at, uh, Sonance, which is not a Utah company, um, California yeah. company. So did you, did you make the move out to California at that point or were you still, uh, like just traveling remote kind of role? We did. So I, I moved to New Mexico for GE Smart, moved to Austin for NetStreams, moved from Austin to California for GE Smart. I'm sorry, for Sonance. Um, and uh, I, I was married in between NetStreams and Sonance. And, and so my wife and I moved out there. And, and what a great company, right? And what a great story uh, behind Dana Innovations and Sonance and, the, and those brands and, and had some great mentors there, you know, the CEO, Sean Sugarman at the time was a fantastic mentor to me and, and gave me great advice on, you know, how to be a more mature person, more mature leader and things that he said to me that stick in my own mind that I share now with other people. So, you know, while I don't talk to Sean Sugarman much anymore, uh, you know, his legacy carries on and, and the things that he taught me and, and Scott and Jeff, the, the founders of the company were always so good to me and my family as well. So, what a great company. Um, Ari Supran's a great CEO and uh, still stay in touch with him. And Jeff uh, over there is their VP of sales as well. So, uh, or Jason, sorry, um, Jason Sloan. Yeah, Jason. Uh, yep. Those are two of my, my best friends in the industry. Um, cool. I, I really respect them. And their company culture is just, um, it's something to emulate, really. Yeah. Um, it, it, the, they, the moment you walk in the door there, you just feel um, like you're in a comfortable place where you can um, relax. And, and I guess that leads to really good business opportunities as yeah. well because of it. So. Yeah. Some of my favorite people in the industry, uh, work and live there at uh, Dane innovation. So the good, good people. Yeah, for sure. Well then, then you, you, um, you, you start, you have a long career with, um, a blend of control for and, and snap and it's, uh, and it's different names there, a snap AV originally, um, in, in the middle, you have this, uh, funny little, little side, year at uh, Savant, which I, I can only say that you're like uh, infiltrating them to get ideas and bring it back to control for it. <laughs> but I know that's not what happened. You... That's not what happened, but uh, <laughs> yeah, might be perceived that way. But uh... No, but what, so so uh, I, I don't want to put you on the spot because when you see like a, a short blip on someone's uh, um, resume, you, you don't you don't want to dwell on what what might have happened there. But um, yeah. it looks like it looks like more than anything you, you really did. Um, connect the like control for is like where I really want to be. And this is a good long stretch for you, for your career. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what I'll say about, uh, control four and the founders of that company, um, great people and, uh, had developed and what I would say was one of the best cultures that I had belonged to as a company. Um, and all the other companies that I had belonged to were also really good cultures, but, there was just something special and something different about control four and, and, and the right timing of the market and everything that happened with that company. And why it wasn't free of problems and struggles, um, the people behind it, uh, were what pushed through those challenges and those struggles. And, um, from the, from the maturity of the leadership to say, Hey, it's time to hand our business over to a CEO that can take us public, that can really scale the business, you know, and just the smart decisions that were made there. Um, and then the experience that I was able to, uh, to get there from really smart sales leaders and other people in marketing that were really smart. And just, uh, when I mean, we just, we'd really assembled a really fantastic team and, and I attribute a lot of my growth in my career during that tenure and time at, at uh, Control 4 
Um, and it was just a fantastic experience. And, and it was one of the first companies that I joined that we'd actually went public and actually made money. So, and all the other companies that we're making, you know, really trying hard to do those things just didn't happen. But, uh, so it was fantastic to see one actually get to completion to an acquisition. Um, so that was a lot of fun. From the, the beginning, and it, it is just amazing to see the starting point and then where they are today. And as part of um, Snap One, as this this huge juggernaut, which is started off modestly as well as kind of a disruptor uh, company, as Snap AV, um, filling a need there in the industry. But um, I think that uh, you're right. It's just to see that growth path and uh and and to see the maturity of of that brand to where it's now just really well established is is impressive and see why you you you'd learn so much from that experience yep yeah and you know i i enjoyed my time at savant as well there was a ton of great people that that also work there they've got really great technology uh, i think that's really their you know really their strong suit is with bob um, being an engineer and uh, understanding what he wanted in his own experience and able to translate that into something that's commercially viable. You know, there's a lot of credit to be given to that company as well. And while it wasn't a fit for, for me personally, um, and I had an opportunity to come back to Control 4, which made sense for me because um, I wanted to grow inside of that company and that was an opportunity that was given, which is why I returned back to to Control 4. You know, uh, Savant has... Uh, um, done really great work as well. So, and one of the things that Martin Plain said to me when I left the company and I was going to Savant, which they probably could have, you know, made stop me from doing that from a non-compete standpoint, but that wasn't Martin's, um, not, not the way that Martin thought or operated in terms of just how he cared about people. But he said, uh, Hey Kim, um, you have to have more than one team to have a Super Bowl." And I thought that was really wise, uh, advice, right? So it wasn't that, one company needed to be the winner and the only company out there, but he saw the value in having multiple companies that should be successful in this space. And he was always willing to partner um, and do what was right for the industry as well. So I, I really appreciated that experience and that, that, um, that, that time period where it was a struggle to understand what I should do from a career path standpoint. But great people like Martin seem to drive some clarity into into the way you think about things, and and he was a great mentor to me as well. Yeah, that's a really really nice uh, perspective that you don't hear enough of um, because things in our little industry get so competitive sometimes, especially yeah. certain brand uh, certain categories uh, where there's just not a lot of room. Uh, doesn't seem like there's a lot of room for competition, but. Uh, when it comes down to it, we are a small industry and we're all trying to get bigger and grow this thing. And mm -hmm. to have that perspective is, is pretty, pretty, uh, you know, uh, enlightening. So I, I really, I really have enjoyed hearing you connect to so many of these leaders in the industry and, and all the connections you've made along the way. Um, as we look ahead um, for screen innovations mm -hmm. and we all look towards Cedia Expo at the end of September, that's one of the big milestones of the year yeah um, is there anything you can kind of preview as far as what uh folks who are thinking about attending the show or already uh registered might uh, see at your booth there yeah so um yeah you know we're we're obviously attending cedia this year i think a lot of people are going to be attending cedia this year and if uh, you know i was i will say to the the dealer base that's listening to this is make sure you attend um, I think it's going to be a great year for everybody that's attending the show relative to what SI is going to be showing. We're going to be, we're going to be showing off all of our latest and greatest uh, products that we're in development of as well. Um, we've got uh, a couple of announcements that we're going to be making here shortly before Cedia. Um, so stay tuned for those. I don't want to tip anybody's hat yet, but um, there's a long roadmap of things that we're going to be doing to um, improve product as well as to invent new stuff as well and get into and get into different areas of the of the business that uh, might make sense for us relative to the things that we are doing already. So um, I think that the future for SI is super bright and I wouldn't have joined the company if I didn't think so. And I wouldn't have joined the company if I didn't think that I would add value to it as well. So um, and I'm just really overall just very happy to be part of this industry 
in general. And it's such a great place to be with so many friends. And, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of things that we can do that people need, but there's also a lot of things that we do that people want. But uh, um, uh, it's just, it's great to be with you as well and spend some time. And, and thank you for allowing me to, to join this podcast. Well, I, I had a great time talking to you and, and really re, re uh, tracing your career path and, and learning about the new role. It's, uh, it, SI was one of the companies that did make it to Indianapolis last year for CD Expo. Yeah. And I truly did enjoy our conversation. It was a stress-free environment because there was, there were fewer of us there and we could actually just have real conversations and the, the brand, even at that point before I'm sure a lot of your insights are going to come in and help make it even better, had some great stuff going on. So I look forward right. to connecting there uh, in Dallas and, uh, and best of luck in your new role and continue um, evolving that company uh, throughout the rest of the year and years ahead. Thanks All for right. taking the time out. Thank you. Take care, guys. Kim Parker is COO of Austin, Texas-based Screen Innovations. You can track him down on LinkedIn and learn about his company at ScreenInnovations.com. And that wraps up today's show. If you're new to Residential Tech Talks, please subscribe to the weekly podcast on your preferred platform and consider rating or reviewing us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Also, check out all the latest residential tech news at the magazine's website, restechtoday.com, where you can also subscribe to our print or digital magazine and to our Tuesday and Friday email newsletters. Until next time, please stay safe, stay inspired, and let us know if you have a great story to tell. Residential oh, tech talks, mentors, and lighting specialists to our residential tech house.